Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us at the Robert Zicklin Center for Corporate Integrity. I'm David Rosenberg, director of the center and a professor in the law department here at Brooke College. I'm delighted to welcome our longtime friend, Erica Karp, to talk about her work in ESG analysis. During the talk, I'm sure she will explain why she does not like the term ESG investing. You sometimes hear the phrase, the controversy over ESG or the ESG backlash. I think that this can only make sense if you have the wrong definition of ESG. As I see it, the world has a lot of problems, climate change, pollution, income inequality, and corruption, to name a few. There can be no question that all of these have to a great extent been, been created by the free market, corporations, and the people who invest in them. But they are realities that we cannot afford to ignore. ESG analysis simply takes into account several important factors influencing the risks and prospects associated with a possible investment opportunity based on these incontrovertible facts. For example, an investor who takes an interest in a company that engages in oil prospecting must look at the possibility that stricter regulations or climate change might make mining the oil more expensive, that local opposition because of environmental concerns might make the project impossible, or that corruption might make it extremely dangerous. The title of today's talk is The ESG Advantage, which simply means that those who exploit the methods of ESG will have an advantage over those who reject or deny it out of stubbornness, ignorance, or because they somehow believe that it sends a political message that they reject. I'm hoping that the audience will have a lot of questions uh, after listening to Erica's talk. And I just wanna make sure that we all understand the procedure uh, for doing that. Um, you can use your chat to uh, send a message to questions, Matt LaPere, and he will field your question and I will ultimately be the one who, who poses it uh, to our speaker. So uh, let's please welcome, you can use uh, one of the well, you, one, one of the happy apps, one of the happy reactions uh, to welcome our speaker, uh, Erica Karp. Oh. Uh, David, thank you so much. And again, it's it's been about 10 years since I've been here and an awful lot has happened. We've made an awful lot of progress um, and that's good. And that said, we have gone not far enough by any means. You know, when it comes to investing in alternative energies, maybe we're doing a trillion dollars a year. That's great. But in terms of transforming uh, the whole energy system, we probably need about seven trillion a year. So that gives you an example. Um, the scary stuff, I mean, think about the extent to uh, which we are having um, extinctions of animals and, and you know, um, all living beings. And probably people may not realize this, but about 10,000 species go extinct every year, you know. Um, and that comes from the idea that we have 100 million species of everything on the planet. So, I mean, and that obviously is, is um, uh, inextricably linked to the climate problem. Um, when it comes to hunger and education and health care, another crisis, uh, mental health care, when it comes to these huge crises, we have a compounded problem whereby trust in the institutions has been lost to some degree. We have to rebuild that. So as you can see, there's a lot going on. Um, I'm gonna stop for a minute and go back to give you um, just an idea of my journey and the context uh, that everything I've done kind of sits in. And so um, um, I spent about 25 years uh, in the capital markets at UBS uh, primarily, and um, that was in institutional equities. And then for most of the time I worked as um, a director of global sector research for the investment bank. And so what that means is that all the analysts and strategists and economists who had a global remit, that was my team. And, um, and at the same time, I was the chair of the Global Investment Review Committee, which means I got to ask questions, whatever questions I wanted. And questions, you know, I think we all know, they are the starting point for wisdom. So in any case, um, way back, maybe 15 years ago, I was asked to take on uh, the SRI team as part of my remit with the global sector team. And so they asked me to take this. It's maybe five people in London. And I said, OK, great. Uh, by the way, what, what is SRI? And so I was told that's socially responsible investing. 
And so I'm like, okay, so so does that mean that all other investing is irresponsible? Like, what is that? And so what I learned very quickly is what we're talking about from a pragmatic standpoint is the systematic integration of, of material environmental, social, and governance factors. Okay, so that kind of analysis, and by the way, ESG analysis is a discipline, all right? It's not a style of investing. It's not a, you know, it, it's a discipline. It's not a strategy, um, as David mentioned. It is a research discipline. And back then, I have to tell you that I had to be a little bit subversive at UBS because if you were talking about values or ideology in any way, you know, that's pushed aside. That's not investing. And so I always use the term governance. And the, the reality is, you know, if a firm is looking at environmental and social issues systematically, that's part of good governance. If a firm is not looking at environmental and social issues, it is by definition poorly governed. It's tautological. All right. So in any case, I immediately changed the name of the team um, to the sustainable investment team that I was comfortable with uh, that term. And so we started to incorporate all the ESG factors that were material into the investment process. And again, I had to do it in a little bit of a subversive way. And so if a semiconductor analyst was coming to the, uh, the IRC, and they're talking about, you know, the fundamentals and they want to upgrade shares. And, you know, we know that a company might have been making a $5 billion investment in a new fab. And I would ask, oh, by the way, um, I understand they're making that investment in a water stressed area. And um, what, what kind of are they doing with water efficiency, you know, for those high end ships? Usually I got a weird look and they had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, do you know if they lose their license to operate, that's $5 billion down the toilet. That is material. And so basically I started asking different questions. Um, and so anyway, over those years um, at UBS, I began to have more and more conviction that this doesn't have to be ideological. It's not political. It is about good investment rigor. And so more and more, I, I became, you know, I went outside of UBS and I worked um, with the World Economic Forum and the Clinton Global Initiative um, and the UN. Um, and, and in doing this, again, I stayed pragmatic. Meanwhile, the backlash that we have now um, is to some extent, you know, imposed on ourselves because we didn't get the definitions right. You know, like David and I are saying, it's a discipline. In any case, let me go back. So I was at UBS for all those years and I started to see um, issues in the whole system of the capital markets. You know, the investment bank didn't talk to the wealth management team and they never talked to the asset management team. And they never knew, you know, work that the accountants were doing in terms of disclosure. And they didn't necessarily know what the academics were doing and the regulators and all the pieces that touch each other in the system of the capital markets. There was a deficit of um, attention. And by the way, I deeply believe that we are in an attention economy now. Attention is now one of the highest value commodities that we have. And so it felt to me like people weren't paying attention to the system. Meanwhile, I'm feeling more and more urgency about getting something done, given you know what we're seeing in the world. So I decided to found my own firm, and that was called Cornerstone Capital Group. And um, that was in 2013. And so with Cornerstone, this was a purpose-built impact investment advisory. And um, founding your own firm, some of you I'm sure are entrepreneurs. It by far is the hardest thing I've ever done. And to some degree, it feels like you're jumping out of a plane and building the parachute on the way down. It was crazy uh, intense from the capital raising to the operational issues, to the growth and scaling issues. So anyway, we went from about, well, we went from zero 
uh, to about a billion and a half um, uh, in assets. And then most recently uh, in 2020, uh, 2021, I sold the company to Pathstone, which is a hundred billion dollar uh, multifamily office. And the idea is to scale. So the idea of taking the IP of Cornerstone, the expertise in the market, the field building work, and then you know, merging with a company that is operationally, technologically, financially super strong. And so that's what's going on with Pathstone now. In any case, so that's all the background. But back to the idea of paying attention. When I was launching Cornerstone and was seeing, and, and by the way, this is still the case now, but I was seeing a lot of unprecedented stuff all right, in the markets, in the world. For instance, um, what we're seeing now is an unprecedented level of economic um, concentration of power. And so just to give you a sense, the top 10 companies in the world um, generate about um, $5 trillion in revenues a year. Uh, that's about 6% of global GDP, 10 companies. So that implies, you know, we are going to have more scrutiny, more regulation, but that concentration is unprecedented. Um, with regard to uh, communications and media, social media, we are in a place where um, the transparency, including lots of Obfuscation, obfuscation is unprecedented. We've never seen this kind of environment and it's good and it's also incredibly scary. In fact, there's a professor at, um, at uh, University of San Francisco, we talk about ethics in AI. And the first question I asked her is, um, how scared should I be? So that led obviously to an important conversation which we'll leave uh, for another time. But anyway, so social media, unprecedented, big data in terms of being able to an analyze it, right? Unprecedented. So in terms of try trying to turn all the noise into actual data with predictive insight, theoretically, we are in an unprecedented place. And then on top of that, um, you do have finally and alignment of those pieces of the capital markets, right? So the investment banks, the asset managers, wealth managers, all the other pieces are coming together in terms of understanding that we need to move trillions um, in the capital markets towards progress. So it is, you know, it is really a, um, um, unprecedented and really constructive. And on top of that, we finally have kind of standards for disclosure. Europe's a little ahead, but they're building uh, their standards off the work of the SASB. I'm one of the um, founding board members of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Very proud of the work we did there. But that's a piece of infrastructure, standards for disclosure. And so again, unprecedented um, that this is coming along. And then finally, you have an unprecedented transfer of wealth. Uh, intergenerational transfer of wealth. And frankly, the next generation, your generation, is demanding and smart and well-informed and questions and, 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 you know, you can make such so much faster progress. And by the way, you should be pretty pissed that generations, hopefully a little bit before May, but, you know, but your future has been mortgaged to some degree by past generations. And you are owed that duty of care um, that boards of directors should be responsible. So all of those things are unprecedented. And so those are the things that I was paying attention to that allowed me to launch a company that was, um, you know, that made me an impact entrepreneur. Um, and by the way, I, I meet people a lot of times that say that they are, um, you know, the serial entrepreneurs. I don't understand that. I couldn't possibly do this intense work um, with the belief, the purpose, you know, for another initiative. So God bless them. I am not a serial entrepreneur, you know, 
one great entity that affected the world um, that's scaling. So, um, you know, that's enough for me in terms of founding companies. But in any case, so, so I want to talk about those things being, you know, again, unprecedented. And my the language that I use is the together, understanding this, paying attention to this, um, taking action about this can lead us, can lead us to transforming the capital system. We can transform it towards a more um, regenerative and inclusive global economy. And by doing that, I think we can rebuild the trust in our, um, you know, our, our system, the trust in our institutions. So that was and is um, the purpose that I've had. Um, I just, I wanna throw something in there um, because, you know, being an entrepreneur uh, was not actually kind of part of my theoretical plan, but, um, but who knows what they're gonna end up doing, where your purpose drives you. So I'm gonna give you a quote that I am reminded of, and this is from the scholar, um, a rabbinic scholar named Martin Buber. And Buber, um, he talks about the I and the thou, and the idea of true connection and being really in it with someone, not just looking at something. And Buber, um, that, that's deeply human. And I think, again, the humanity and the soul of the capital markets have been lost, but I think um, we can get them back. And the quote that Buber has said that has always struck me is um, that every journey has a destination to which the traveler is unaware. And I, I find that really interesting from the standpoint of, you know, an evolution of someone's career. I had no idea uh, where I would be. And, um, and I'm glad, I'm glad um, that I ended up here. And had I known where I was going to go, uh, it wouldn't be as productive and as creative and, and as um, gratifying. So remember, it's a journey. And along the journey, pay attention. All right. So pay attention to the unprecedented stuff that, that I mentioned. So um, let's talk about ESG for a minute, ESG analysis. Again, if, everyone, if anyone uses the term ESG investing to you, or an ESG strategy or an ESG fund um, run in the other direction, all right? ESG, by the way, I could use ESG analysis to destroy the planet as easily as I can to save the planet, all right? Find me the companies that are the most destructive and in that being the most, um, um, inconsistent and obfuscating anything they have. Like you can use ESG analysis for anything. And again, it's pragmatic. So you don't have to get into the political or the values oriented discussion. This is why ultimately the backlash, it's already starting to fail, right? It's just frankly ignorant of you know, investing. So in any case, um, I don't mind the term sustainable investing. I like the term impact investing. I like the term uh, catalytic capital, um, philanthropy, okay, it's good. It's in that, you know, continuum of the ways to move capital. I personally prefer impact investing to, um, uh, to philanthropy, and that's because I like to see money used over and over again. I like that economic multiplier effect, but philanthropy is great too. Um, so in any case, on that continuum, ESG analysis comes first, then you can do any kind of investing that you want. Um, by the way, there's, there's a couple of myths that some people um, still kind of perpetuate. And let me, um, let me share some of those and maybe we can talk more about them. The fact that you, or the notion that you have to give up market rate returns to invest sustainably, that is a myth. And there are hundreds and hundreds of reports um, that show it, it's a myth. Using ESG analysis, 
you know, worst case, no difference, but it is part of the secret sauce of some uh, investors. In fact, most hedge funds, they do this, you know, the baddest, meanest hedge funds, they've always done this because it's good research, right? So um, again, along that continuum of allowing for, you know, totally concessionary returns or totally market rate returns, you do not have to underperform the markets. Myth. Second myth, um, ESG analysis is counter to uh, fiduciary duty. Wrong. Not only is it wrong, um, it is frankly the opposite. You know, if um, if an investor, a professional investor, an individual investor does not look at material ESG factors, then they are breaking their fiduciary duty. Um, so that's another myth that we can put aside. So those are things um, that we can think about. Um, so in terms of, you know, where we should go, we can go anywhere we want right now. What I would like to say is something about, uh, this is a question I get asked, um, all the time. Um, and it relates to active ownership. All right. Um, active ownership. Okay. Getting engaged with a company rather than, uh, divesting. Not everyone's going to give you the answer, but I believe that that is a more constructive way to have change. Um, with regard to divestment, it is great for attention, to get attention, to make noise. But the bottom line is, as a, as a uh, someone who divests, you are not going to affect the cost of capital for a large company. It's it, You're just not. So in terms of um, my preference, um, engagement uh, is a more interesting way to go. And by the way, individuals, we are able to democratize engagement. And so, for instance, there's a wonderful organization, As You Sow, and you can get engaged. You can be part of proxy discussions and filing of resolutions. Um, so I think, and, and small enterprises can actually make a difference. Right. So like with engine number one, I mean, they made a difference to the, to the structure of Exxon's board of directors to actually get some climate uh, wisdom on there. All right. So, again, I am a believer in um, in active ownership. And by the way, I, I should tell you that, you know, if we go back to like Adam Smith, Milton Friedman, like Adam Smith, the invisible hand, he, he was a good guy. Adam Smith um, believed that you know, people were kind of exquisitely interested in um, uh, in the circumstances of others. That's from the theory of moral sentiments before the wealth of nations. And then we come out with the invisible hand and that's kind of slapped us in the head when it comes to capitalism. He didn't think about externalities. He didn't think enough, say enough about the long-term um, outcomes in the capital markets. And then you go to Milton Friedman, also not kind of a shitty guy, but his legacy is not cool. You know, he didn't include that term uh, long-term in his discussions. And when it comes to corporate governance, he gave, frankly, a bad signal. I bet, and I'm, you know, I talked to a lot of groups about this, I would bet that most groups of investors, if you ask, who is the board ultimately accountable to? You got your shareholders, you got your employees, you got your communities, you got plenty of other stakeholders. Who is the board ultimately accountable to? And I would bet that most groups and most of you are thinking, well, it's the shareholders, you know, and that's what Milton Friedman's legacy is. Granted, who am I? He was wrong. He was absolutely wrong. And my inspiration comes from uh, Mervyn King of South Africa, who's kind of the grandfather of corporate governance. The board of directors is ultimately responsible to the company, to the company. And by being responsible to the company, all right, it, the board is responsible. Its duty of care is not, um, is not sacrificing anyone. All right. So I would like everyone, you know, to think about that um, because there are 
you know, legacy, um, you know, legacy definitions that just like with ESG um, have put us at risk. Um, there's legacy definitions of uh, economic activity and governance that have put us at risk. So um, those are a few of the things that um, I wanted to share and that, you know, it's a, an aggregation of kind of stuff over the years from the standpoint of, you know, an investment bank director of research, um, an entrepreneur, an asset manager who launched a fund um, and a wealth advisor. So I am fortunate to have had many hats. And over the course of, you know, my 30 years in the business, um, I feel like I have kind of earned the right to say things unequivocally. And I, I love questions. I love to question myself, of course, as per Socrates, you know, questions are the starting point um, for wisdom, you know. Um, so anyway, those are some of the things that I wanted to share. And on that note, I will turn it back to David. Muted. Thank you. Okay, here we are. Uh, my mouth is moving and words are coming out. Uh, I think we'll have a, have plenty of questions. My first one is: you did use the word, you did use the phrase "duty of care" twice, and I wrote it down. Uh, the second time was just a few moments ago, talking about the duty that the uh, board owes to the company, right? And I think you were saying that in contrast um, to to distinguish it from their duty to the shareholders, as emphasized by um, Milton Friedman. Uh, but earlier on, you talked about. Uh, the generation in control now uh, breaching its duty of care to the new generation. And it seems to me that there's a um, disjunction between, you know, the duty that the law imposes, and I think you described it accurately, and this sort of greater moral duty uh, to, to, to the future. And I think some people who are, who are troubled by um, sort of thinking about it that way, you, you know, we'll say if the law says the duty is to the company, then you are allowing the new generation to be hung out to dry. I'm allowing past generations to be hung out to dry. I am suggesting that new generations use their voice and use their power Again, there, um, I, I apologize if I expressed it the other way around before, but, you know, I, you know, the piece of me is in the next generation. I have three daughters and I am not surprised that they are so cynical, um, you know, that they want the capital markets kind of blown up. But the reality is still capitalism remains the best system we've ever known for creating prosperity, you know? Um, so yes, I think the older generations, like I said, have mortgaged the future by using, you know, one and a half times the resources, the annual resources of the earth, you know? And so, yeah, I think, I think a duty of care as a human being, you know, is what is um, appropriate now. You know, and by the way, it's not like this intergenerational transfer of wealth is happening tomorrow, right? The money slowly moves to the next generation, you know, and they're learning and they're educating. And, and it's one of the reasons, you know, I'm here, right? And if you think about it, um, and this, I love this. This is, um, this is Benjamin Franklin. He said that we won't have justice until those that are unaffected are as outraged as those who are affected, right? And so for the most part, you know, those who have, you know, been in college, those who are in the West, the developed world, um, they're not affected as much by, you know, the crisis. We know that the climate crisis 
um, is much more uh, damaging. It hits to a disproportional effect people of color, you know, people in lower economic statuses, people in the emerging world, they are affected. We frankly are less so, but we need to be as outraged, in fact, maybe more so than they are. And so that when we think about climate and we think about a just transition, this is not easy, but it absolutely has to happen. So, um, you know, the duty of care as it relates to that intergenerational flow, um, that is moral and that is ethical. Um, and in terms of, you know, when you're talking to which audiences that you're talking to, you know, again, at my old firm at UBS, I did have to be subversive because it couldn't be about values. It had to be about creating value. So you do have to communicate effectively depending on what audience. Does that, is that help, David? Yes, it does. Yes, a lot. Um, and sort of thinks of, uh, it helps one think about it in terms of sort of short term and long term as well. We have some uh, practical questions. Uh, can you provide some concrete examples of companies that have successfully integrated ESG practices into their business strategies and seen positive impacts on their competitiveness and value creation. Sure, there's so many. There really are so many. And this is a race to the top. You know, this is when we started the SASB and the idea of, you know, disclosure of material stuff. You know, again, the companies that were more progressive about disclosing, and in particular, disclosing material factors, um, you can start to see the progress. The companies that didn't um, or that haven't given disclosure you know, it, it, ESG analysis is a starting point for inquiry, all right? So let me give you an example. And by the way, ESG analysis and corporate disclosure, these are a starting point, again, for inquiry, all right? They will not give you the answer. No single data point will give you the answer or what, what to do. And there are data points that you want, but aren't mandated in terms of disclosure. So let me give you an example. I'm gonna give you an example of a chemical company all right. And lots of sustainable investors think you don't want to be in chemicals. Well, the reality is, if you don't want to be in chemicals, then say goodbye to your sneakers and your tires and your wine and your toys. We're all in chemicals. Wine has like 10,000 chemicals in it. OK, so take an example of BASF. BASF is a highly sustainable company. They are incredibly thoughtful about their engagement and their mining in communities. They are incredibly thoughtful about their safety practices and, and they, they put out, right? So they audit their you know, 10,000 um, providers of product that they need. They audit their providers and not only do they audit them, but they watch the auditing and they circle back. And if one of their providers has multiple misses in terms of safety, they fire them, right? So that's attention. That is very material. That is consistency, you know? Now that process, you're not gonna see that in any particular disclosure, but this is why the ESG analysis plus the disclosures is so important. Um, so that's an example of an energy company that's highly sustainable, uh, of a chemical company. I'm going to give you another one that you wouldn't think is sustainable. But um, if you think about Apache, all right, well, I guess, right? Well, Apache is doing all kinds of, um, all kinds of, you know, drilling and exploration and everything else. And when you think about drilling and exploration, exploration. you got to think about the chemicals that are put in the water that's pumped in the ground to squeeze out, you know, the oil. Well, Apache has always been much more transparent than any other company about the stuff that's going in the water that's going into, you know, the drilling. So that's sustainable. And Apache is also really good at a big view of the world. Like they understand that, you know, energy sustainability, you know, it, it's not just a matter of the company itself, 
but it's a matter of um, national security and communicating that to the world, like they're watching outside, is really important. In fact, some of you will start hearing the term double materiality, all right? And double materiality means I'm watching outside as to what's affecting me, and I'm also watching outside for what I am affecting, right? So it's kind of inside and outside. And that goes back to corporate governance and that you know duty of care, um, looking at all sides of it. So you'll start hearing that term. Um, you may or may not have, but you will. Um, yeah, so those are a couple of examples. And again, not as obvious as just you know, an ESG factor. And by the way, um, there's work, you probably all have heard of the work of George Seraphim at Harvard. And George worked with Bob Eccles back when we were launching SASB. And George did a piece, and, yeah, this is a while ago, but I loved it because um, George talked about the extent to which it was a research paper. And he said, companies that report on factors that are not material potentially underperform. So for instance, um, UBS, my, I don't give a rat's ass about UBS's water efficiency. All right. Well, I always care about water because we all know what the last drop of water is worth. But in any case, it's not the point. The point is, I don't want UBS spending time talking about water and efficiency, um, you know, in, in their like 10K or anywhere to investors. It's not the point. Do talk to me about um, um, you know, corporate governance and regulatory compliance and HR issues. You know, talk to me about those. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's the point. It's materiality uh, that matters most. And again, just a starting point for inquiry. Uh we have a, a fairly specific question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the proposed SEC climate rule? Does it go far enough? What aspects do you like about it and what should be added? Yeah, um, and forgive me, I have not spent that much time on the climate rule. I've spent a little more time on the disclosures and a little more time on the uh, naming rules. But with regard to the climate rule, the, the issue is, um, scope one, two, and three. And I think that the idea of including scope three emissions is what real climate investors want. The problem is I think that's gonna be really, really hard uh, for smaller companies down the supply chain. That said, any level of transparency in this, I think is critical. I am worried that, you know, I want the SEC to move really fast um, because again, should we have a change in the administration, uh, the SEC priorities are going to uh, potentially uh, turn around. You know? I think the naming rule is particularly interesting in the context of the conversation we've had. Um, because if a manager, if a fund manager, if a company says, oh, this is an ESG fund, which you already know, I hate that term. But if there's a name that's associated with ESG, sustainability, impact, I think it's great that the SEC is looking to that and is going to look and see, well, is this really? What are you doing to make that so? And always at Cornerstone and Pathstone, I've been like, you know, come <laughs> bring it, you know, because we have a way to talk about our processes uh, explicitly in what we do. But I think that naming rule um, is going to bring down um, the funds and the, the use of ESG um, to a great degree. So I think that's great. You're very enthusiastic about disclosure. And I think some of the skeptics will say, what, what, what does disclosure accomplish? Uh, a company pollutes more than another. It pollutes less than another. Uh, this information is available to the public and to investors. What's the correlation between, you know, disclosure of good practices and bad practices? And, you know, what consequences do they have to the company? 
uh, especially a company that 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 is very transparent about its bad behavior. Yeah. Well, this is what we do. Since ESG analysis, the discipline, is just a starting point for inquiry. It allows investors to do what you know they believe is right. Right. So I'll give you an example. Like I kind of like smoking, drinking, you know, occasionally shooting guns, like, you know, but it's not the point. It's totally not the point. Those might be my values, but as an investment advisor, that's irrelevant. I want to know what my client's values are. And once we do that, right, we can start to do the analysis that helps align um, the values of our clients with the values of a company. So I'll give you an example. Um, actually, I think they've gotten better, but Chick-fil-A, like I have, I've eaten there once. And then somebody told me that, um, that Chick-fil-A is incredibly, um, I don't know how to describe it, but I'll, I'll use the term kind of exclusionary and anti-progressive in some of their ideas. Like for instance, they apparently believed um, in uh, therapy to fix gay people. So I have a fundamental problem. Um, can I stop you? That. When you say they, who do you mean? The company. Okay, the company. It's a, it's a privately held company. Privately held company. Uh, so it's the, the family. Yep, the yep. family. The board. It still has a board of directors. Mm. So that company has values that are very different from mine. And um, so I would choose not to, as a, as a customer, I would choose not to be one, right? Is that issue, let's say they were a public company, is that issue material to the economic outcomes? Some people would say yes, and some people would say no. To me, it's material, knowing I'm a customer that, or I'm not a customer, right? So again, that's why this isn't black and white. But this is why transparency is important. I don't want to invest in a company that is antithetical to my own values, right? Um, so, so again, when it comes to um, the disclosure, the transparency, it simply helps me um, to invest, right? If you take a two cruise lines, all right, if you look at whoever, Royal Caribbean and Carnival, I want to know which cruise line is more thoughtful about safety, about emissions, you know, about, and these, these are things that are affecting their bottom line, energy efficiency, who's trying harder, you know, to use different um, sustainable energies. It, it matters. So once I know the difference, I can make a better decision, you know, and so Again, most of the studies we've seen, and we put a, a piece of research out and everyone's welcome to it. It's called Sacrifice Nothing, right? So this is a meta study, but you don't even have to say that ESG analysis gives you, you know, a competitive advantage. Like I personally think it does and lots of studies say it does, but even if it doesn't, it allows you to better align the values, right? That's why I think the transparency and, and the, you know, reporting is so important. Hopefully it allows, again, a race to the top because companies, you know, a CEO does not want to hear that, oh, in terms of protecting, you know, the species and the planet, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of your safety track record, you don't want to be, you know, kind of the worst in, a, in your group. You know, CEOs don't like that, but there are ratings and rankings and it matters, you know, and what you want for investors is comparable, projectable, reliable, assured uh, ESG, ESG data. This might be sort of too technically a, a legal question, uh, but when you were uh, puncturing the couple of myths that you mentioned, um, you said that ESG, the, you talk about the myth that ESG is counter to uh, the fiduciary duties of boards. And uh, I think the skeptic would say a board has a decision to make about, you know, what kind of trucks it's going to use to to 
deliver uh, the goods that it develops. And uh, it needs to buy a new fleet of trucks and it's considering buying electric, one, uh, uh, electric trucks. Uh, although month to month, uh, you know, because the, 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 the month to month at the bottom line will be greater. Uh, as a result of buying the uh, electric trucks rather than good old fashioned uh, diesel or gasoline. Uh, and that this is not acting according to their fiduciary duties to, to their shareholders or to the corporation, whoever you think the fiduciary duties are owed to. Um, and that perhaps even with the improved PR that they'll get by appearing to be green to their customers, uh, it still will be a net loss. Can we say that 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 the decision to to buy a fleet of electric vehicles uh, is against their fiduciary duties? You're thinking long term or short term, right? And remember, I just want to make the distinction. So we have a board of directors that has a fiduciary duty, duty of care to the company. And then you have professional asset managers and wealth managers that are fiduciaries in terms of the guidance that they give their, you know, their, their investors, their asset owners. So with regard to the company, and in both cases, I do believe in asking the question long-term, right? So ultimately, um, if a new fleet of trucks, and again, this is a decision that the executive team rather than the board of directors is gonna be making, right? But the bottom line is if the new fleet of electric vehicles is going to ultimately uh, save costs, allow for carbon emissions, allow for better regulatory compliance, right? All those things over the long term, then that's a reasonable executive decision. And again, since the board has a, a fiduciary duty to the company, it will oversee that. Um, and really, it is the same in terms of, you know, an asset manager or wealth manager that has the fiduciary duty uh, to their clients. You know, what do they think? So, again, it goes to long term, um, in my view, and it goes to, um, again, the duty of care over the long term. I think that's, yeah, uh... I think if you think about it that way, and the old fashioned way of thinking, I think is how we got to where we are, which is short term. And certainly a company that adapts to electric vehicles now uh, might see a hit in the short term, but you know, they change their storage facility to have the electrical hookups for the trucks. And long term, they might be ahead of the game. Yeah, uh, because they they adopted something yeah. which will inevitably be necessary, and that the uh, the ESG mentality results in in the better long term yeah. outcome. And think uh, about Unilever, Paul Pullman, who was you know his legacy is well known. Think about Tim Cook, right, and Apple. Both those CEOs have made the comment: if you're thinking short term, the near term stock price, do not buy shares in the company. They have explicitly said that. That's an example of transparency. Great, I really appreciate that. And by the way, the incentive structures all across those pieces of the capital markets are kind of messed up. I mean, if you go right down to kind of institutional equity salespeople, or you go to research analysts at investment banks, or you go to portfolio managers at you know giant asset manager firms, right? All the incentives associated um, with most of the pieces of the capital markets are short term in nature, you know, and that's why they have things like the what is it? The sustainable uh, stock exchange initiatives. I'm not a fan just because you know I don't believe in separating you know, two kinds of, of companies. Um, but, but I understand why the initiative uh, could be there. Um, so again, it is, there's no, um, there's no black and white in most decisions, right? So any executive team, you know, and, and asset managers and asset owners too, there's always compromises. There's always trade-offs. Right. If a company wants to invest 
um, in innovation, right? In the long term, innovation. And even when there are, you know, downturns in the market, you know, an innovative company is going to recover more quickly and ultimately will grow more quickly. But investing in innovation, that takes money, you know? And so even I actually did a conference call, you can see it somewhere on the web, but I had uh, Jostian Solheim, who was the CEO of Ben and Jerry's for many years. And more importantly, now he's the CEO of the Americas for Unilever. And he talked, we talked specifically about trade-offs. In fact, I think we called the webinar um, Embrace the Gray, you know, and it was a great call if you can find it on our website. It, it's there somewhere. Um, but there's no there's no black and white, you know. Here's again where transparency comes in, you know. Tell me what's going on. I will decide as an investor what works for me. I have to say that my understanding of the problem of short-termism uh, was enlightened by a talk we had at the center last year uh, by uh, with the author of the book, uh, The Man Who Broke Capitalism, about uh, GE and Jack Welch. Uh, the author's name is David Gallis. And it really did wake me up to the long-term consequences on communities and human beings of the kind of short-term thinking that made him uh, apparently a very successful executive uh, during mm. the time that he was there. Uh, mm. We have eight more minutes here because I know there's a hard end at, at uh, 1.30. Uh, while more and more companies in the U.S. and Europe participate in, quote, good ESG practices, what are your thoughts on countries like India, China, and Russia, accounting for some of the world's largest CO2 emissions, yet have shown little interest in participating in more sustainable practices? Uh, I wish there were a better answer you know, to what's going on um, politically. Um, you know, we're seeing backward movement, you know, obviously in Russia, also in India, um, China. I, I, I don't want to call it backward movement, but it's a shift, you know, to a, an older regime, you know, from the past. So certainly it's not in the direction of, of capitalism and democracy. And unfortunately, those three nations were big and big emitters. Um, I don't know the answer. I just honestly, um, you know, again, as I've said, I believe in the mechanisms of capitalism more than I believe in those of, you know, other systems. Um, so I guess, you know, we need, I don't know who we need to have this particular in-depth conversation. You should get Ian Bremmer, actually, on this call. That would be really cool, you know. I think I know someone who has his uh, contact information. Great. So, uh, and that, there's that another, would be great. Another one that's obviously controversial and probably not accessible um, is Henry Kissinger. Kissinger has a book, I think his last book is, I think it's called The World Order. And again, I know how controversial a figure he is, but there's some real wisdom in that book. So um, again, the question here, these are world order questions, way above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions from people who identify themselves as students. Um, one uh, asks for practical advice as I get ready to launch my career in sustainability. Mm. I mean, hopefully that the idea of paying attention, close attention um, to, to the needs, you know, to drive it. Again, I mentioned a more uh, regenerative and inclusive form of capitalism. Pay attention to what's needed. You know, I mentioned um, the idea of incentive structures. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to um, lessons of the market. And sometimes these are old lessons. They're really sensible. And George Soros has a million books out there. You know, he pays attention and he has values, which you may not agree with. Um, but I think, you know, those ultimately could be helpful in some of the decisions, bringing it right down. I know this sounds geeky, 
pay attention to accounting, all right? Um, uh, Prince Charles, excuse me, King Charles, um, had an initiative uh, called the A4S, the Accounting for Sustainability Initiative out of London, focusing on CFOs, right? And he made the statement once, um, I got to meet him, which was really cool, except I did a faux pas because he put his hand out. I put my hand out to shake it, but then I was so excited to see him that I did that second hand. And apparently that was a big faux pas. But anyway, um, this A4S initiative uh, is really important, accounting for sustainability. So if you can get involved in that, I think that could be uh, very, very helpful. Uh, we, we'll edit out your gaffe about uh, Prince. Uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, the, it when, it when gets worse. The, because... When we make the video. Uh, okay. okay, you want a little more of the story? It gets worse because... <laughs> He was actually asking me about kind of the SEC and stuff and ESG. And I I made a point and I I kind of, you know, kind of pointed at him using it. I just talked with my hands. That was a very big faux pas. But then he obviously didn't mind because he asked me if I could go to the SEC and ask them about, you know, disclosure and accounting. And I'm thinking in my head, why would Prince Charles be asking me to go to the SEC for something? I mean, that's, he's Prince Charles, right? He can go to the SEC. And then one of my friends, Sir David King, who did some work with the Royal Family, I'm like, David, why would he possibly ask me? And David said, Erica, that's actually not surprising because he has to stay out of any, you know, structural, political, financial, you know, initiatives of the company, of the country, excuse me. So that was really, really fun. That's one of my most, most fun things, yeah. Great, okay, I guess we have a, a last question. Um, a senior at Baruch asks uh, that he, he or she has heard the argument that measurability is a critical weakness of ESG investing. For example, how do you quantify the cost of Chick-fil-A's socially unpopular views? Mm -hmm. What's the impact on sales, goodwill, and ultimately valuation? Mm -hmm. and what about Apple, which employs child labor mines in Congo and factories in China? How do you quantify its controversial operations? Well, in that question, you have nailed what is the holy grail, measurability. And so what we're seeing is in the, in the private uh, space, private investments. Um, we're starting to see, by the way, some people will tell you that impact investing, which adds kind of the intentionality and measurability to sustainable investing. Some people tell you that kind of impact investing can only be done in the private markets. I do think that the private markets, um, there is more transparency you know, to the owners, to the boards, maybe not to the asset owners, the investors, but the private markets are going to end up, I think, getting us closer to the public markets be, being able to measure, right? And so the measurement, you nailed it, that is the holy grail. But that's one of the reasons we need disclosure. We need to ask the companies how they are measuring, how they are benchmarking, how they are improving. You know, I mentioned BASF. They have their own ways of measuring. And here, I'll give you another one, SAP. SAP, you know, obviously software company, lots of people involved, human capital, salespeople. SAP chose to put a measure in place to look at um, staff turnover. And they actually put a number uh, in revenues associated with staff turnover. Like for every 1% of turnover, you know, we uh, improve revenues by 69 million euros, something like that. I will guarantee that that number is wrong. Guaranteed. That said, they're doing it. They're trying to do it. They're trying to express it. They're tracking it. So it's the, the intention and the effectiveness and the consistency of trying to measure outcomes and revenues um, that's where we really try to go. You know, with, with impact investing, people talk about, you know, the inputs and the outputs and the outcome. And it's the outcomes that ultimately are, are most important. But again, it is about progress. 
It is about transparency. Uh, it is about comparability. It's, again, hopefully a race to the top. But impact measurement, just to ask, answer the other question, getting into that space, I think that's a great idea. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I, I myself was was greatly enlightened uh, about really how this works, and and am armed with with responses uh, to the skeptics. Uh, I would love to be able to invoke some names with you know celebrity names that you mentioned the the new king and uh, the erstwhile secretary of state who's who's still <laughs> remarkably active. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that they're making a contribution in oh, this yeah. area as well. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I thank you for attending everyone. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing the audience and to having Erica back again as well. Cool. All right. Well, Very thank much. you. I appreciate everyone's attention. And uh, again, that attention is so valuable. You know, that commodity. So so good luck out there. Have a great week. Happy Halloween. And um, I'll talk to you all soon.